Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. Stacey Pettyjohn, the Director of the Defense Program at the Center for a New American Security. Joining me today at the CNAS virtual fireside is General David Berger, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. General Berger, welcome, and thank you for being here. I've been looking forward to our conversation. Uh, thanks, Stacey. I'm sorry we had a, a challenge uh, scheduling, but I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited about this because today we're going to talk about Force Design 2030, the progress that's been made to date, what remains to be done, and how the concept has evolved. Before we get into all of that, though, I'd like to run over a few administrative notes. Um, this conversation is public and it's going to be recorded. It'll be available um, to stream afterwards uh, online. We'll post it on our website. I'm gonna reserve at least 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please enter them as we go along at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please note, we don't accept anonymous questions, so be sure to identify yourself. So I've been super excited about this conversation because General Berger has been a trailblazer in terms of focusing on China. And I believe that there's a lot that the other services could learn from this experience what's working, what hasn't, the challenges along the way. Very briefly, I'm gonna provide a little bit of context and background about uh, what Force Design 2030 is for those who are not familiar. And sir, you correct me if I get anything wrong here. But the Marines had been running a lot of war games and from these, they learned that they were not organized, trained, equipped, or postured to win a war fight against China, which the 2018 National Defense Strategy had made a priority. General Berger was the first service chief to announce his intention to make major changes to the Corps to support the NDS in March in 2019. And then in March 2020, he outlined the specific plan that he was going to implement, which was in the document Force Design 2030. And that's going to be where we're going to kick off the conversation today. Sir, could you provide us with an overview of Force Design 2030 and the progress that you've made today? Um, the way you captured it, I think, uh, uh, largely accurate. The only, I think, uh, modifier I would add is the, the beginning of this was an assessment that we weren't organized, trained, or equipped not to win against China primarily, but to deter China, uh, to deter a, a, a pacing threat, in, order, in other words, to accomplish what was laid out in the 2018 National Defense Strategy of fighting China and winning a fight against China is, is, is a, an element of that, but it was primarily about, can you respond to the crisis of the day, the expeditionary sort of force and readiness role, and can how effective are you at deterring China? And everything that we saw told us that we would need to make some fundamental changes. Um, we have, all the services have an annual process for looking at how we're organized, trained, and equipped. We make changes to that every year and include that in a budget cycle. But my assessment, our assessment was that normal annual sort of process, that rhythm was not gonna work because the pace of change, both in the adversary and in technology, the combination of those two was outpacing our ability to keep up on the one year sort of make the minor adjustments and adjust what you have. Fundamentally, in other words, we had, we had to find a way not to, not to use what we had in a better way, but actually how are we going to operate differently in order to deter, in order to respond to a crisis. And if there was a conflict on the whole spectrum of things, then we would, we would be, we would be uh, able to achieve the national objectives in that. So long and short of it, um, what's the value to the joint force? How, did, how can the Marine Corps play that role in the future? It was clearly as a maritime naval force. That's a, it's a huge advantage for the United States. Uh, and we have a number of them in the, in the US military. That's, that is clearly one of them. So over the last two years, the approach was to divest of, get rid of things that may have been useful in the past, certainly were useful in the past, um, but we're not uh, as useful going forward for what we saw as the operating environment in the future. As fast as possible with some, uh, some acknowledgement of the associated risk, divest of those things. Adjust the size of the Marine Corps to the size that we thought would be needed for the future. Uh, in the day-to-day -day sort of um, active campaigning role, but also in a war fight. 
So adjust the size of the Marine Corps, get rid of legacy, things that, that are not going to be as applicable in the future, and turn around and pour that back in, reinvest it back into the Marine Corps of the future. And it's an ongoing process. We knew we didn't have perfect visibility of what 10 years out might look like, but we had a pretty good aim point. So the, the way you hedge against the unknown is you do a lot of wargaming, a lot of experimentation to it, make the adjustments over the next 10, 12, 14 years. And that's where we are right now. We're two years into it, largely successful so far in the leadership here and Congress allowing us to keep those resources and plow them back into the Marine Corps of the future. Make sure that we're ready this afternoon and we're part way through that turn right now. And it'll be a several year turn, uh, as you pointed out, uh, underpinned by a lot of experimentation, a lot of wargaming to answer the questions we don't have answers to today. And then I'll just pause there. That's great, sir. Um, the iterative learning is clearly the way to go. And I've seen firsthand working with some of the staffs in, in the Marine Corps, how, how they're engaged in this long campaign of learning, which is really the way to go at it. Absolutely right on deterrence. Um, I always uh, focus on war fighting because I, I focus on deterrence by denial, which is what the NDS in 2018 obviously did as well. So the name says it all, you're aiming to be have a different force in 2030 but that is a, a ways off. Um, are there some interim steps that you're hoping to hit along the way? Um, and what's the timeline for fielding some of these new capabilities like the Marine Littoral Regiment? Um, the timeline we were moving with obviously a sense of urgency is, is everybody, but we had sort of a head start. So we, it was good, good for the Marine Corps. I think the, the concepts in other words, how we will operate, we're practicing now. We're, we're rehearsing, we're experimenting right now in all parts of our Marine Corps. The, the capabilities that we needed to acquire, uh, they will begin to come online in, in numbers in late 22, 23, 24, 25, but beginning in 23 really is we'll have the capability in the hands of the commanders that they, that they need. Um, only, you know, limited by when if it's a if it's a material kind of a thing, then by production and by resources. But it's not as as many people have pointed out, and we live by in the Marine Corps the material parts, the machinery, the equipment is one part of it. But I think uh, we're rapidly changing the way that we manage our people and the, the talent and the way that we train. Because otherwise, all the concepts and capabilities in the world are, aren't going to work with the current systems that we have for how we manage our people and develop them and how we train ourselves. So we have to now my shoulder is into those two parts, the training part and the, the human part to match the velocity that we're adjusting our organization. But in the, in the, in the very central part of it, so all that is happening ongoing. 2023, you'll see the capabilities in the field that the combatant commanders need. But inside, I think uh, we, we remind ourselves that inside what it takes to become a Marine doesn't, does not change. There is uh, an element, in other words, that, that is core to us, our culture, our ethos of being a Marine and what that means, that doesn't, that doesn't change. Just a different way of operating with some different capabilities. Thanks for that. That is a good point because it's a multifaceted transformation. It's not just about new technologies and new uh, capabilities or weapon systems. Um, and uh, it, you're clearly undertaking a difficult task because it's often noted that it, there's a lot of inertia and a lot of forces that try to resist major changes, especially within military organizations. Um, what are some of the biggest impediments that you've faced thus far? Well, our system, as you point out, rewards um, continuing your program of record, whatever that is. If you're, uh, you know, if you're involved in acquisition, your whole life exists around m modifying, continuing, getting more resources for my program of record. So the system is not built in an agile manner to reward things that are moving at a higher kind of RPM. It's not. It's not. Wasn't designed for that. So it's not, I don't think it's the fault of individuals who are lazy at all. It's a, 
it's a process of bureaucracy, as you, as you point out, that was built for a different speed and in which you could take your time and develop something and four or five years later, it would be okay to get it to the field. Now that's way, that's way too late. It's already, it's already obsolete. So I, I have not run across the human being, I'm lazy, I don't wanna change. We, that's not really our focus. Our focus is on how do you move faster with the tools, the policies that you have? And Congress has given us some, we haven't used all of it. I'm convinced we haven't squeezed all we can out of it in terms of rapid acquisition, rapid testing. Uh, I think la lastly, I will point out to uh, not point out to somebody like I'm teaching, but it's good to remind ourselves that I think the to some degree inertia is OK, because if, if there was none, if there was no resistance, in other words, from a pure physics, we would probably leap left and right every couple of years chasing the next shiny object. So some degree in there is healthy. It, it forces us to, do you have a compelling argument for this change that you're arguing for? If you have it, then go. If you don't, then I think that resistance uh, helps make sure we don't lurch from one side to another chasing sort of the shiny object of the moment. Some degree of that is actually a good thing, but too much will definitely bring you to your knees. That's a good reminder, sir. You definitely don't want to be whiplashed and just sort of uh, moving around rapidly in different directions all the time because that, that would be counterproductive. Um, we actually have a project we're starting or we've begun here at CNAS looking at the unfinished business and defense innovation that uh, hits on that issue that you spoke about in terms of finding ways to better use the authorities that have been given and to more uh, quickly acquire new capabilities because the, all of the processes seem to take far too long and aren't um, moving at the speed of relevance today. Um, thinking about the budgeting process, um, we're hopefully going to have an NDAA uh, soon. Uh, the House just passed their version, waiting on the Senate. As you look at the FY22 budget and then to FY23, which I know you're probably in the stages of completing right now, what are your top priorities? Because we started uh, our force design effort two years ago, we are in that um, middle ground where you've decided like any, I think, even outside of government, in other words, private sector organization, where you've decided fundamentally you need to make some basic, some big changes. You're too far to go back. Uh, you're not far enough where it's uh, you're done and the dust is settled. We're in that middle ground where we're rapidly changing. So I need to watch closely 22, 23, and 24. Um, what am I concerned about? Um, the approach that we're taking. I think this is the deciding point where in the department and in Congress, are they willing to back uh, an organization in the, in the government, in the department that is willing to accept risk, willing to move at speed, willing to discard legacy things uh, learn as fast as as we can. Are are they going to are they going to support enable that to occur or not? Because if they don't, then uh, then you're in a bad place because you've already gotten rid of, you've already divested of the, you've shed the things that you don't think you need for the future. But your the other things are coming, and if they if you're left in the lurch there, that's not a good place to be. So uh, making sure that we protect the investments for force design, making sure that we invest in the talent management things that we know we're going to need in the future, making sure that the resources that we need for training are all in place. And I, I probably uh, in the top, I know not probably, but in the top five is the, how do you get there, which is amphibious ships and the connectors. In other words, the ability to move us around the position to, that the Marine Corps and the Navy needs because they're essential. You can have their great capabilities, but if you're a maritime naval force and you don't have the, the mobility on the water to go places on sovereign ships that you need, then, uh, then you're in trouble. So I'll be watching all of that. So that hits on another topic that I wanted to uh, hit a discuss, which was uh, Navy Marine Corps integration and um, the fact that your concepts are now focused on supporting the fleet and uh, in a large so that you can better deter China. But um, 
uh, integrating with a, another service, even one that's within the same department can be very challenging. So I just wanted you to sort of give mm -hmm. your assessment about what the state of uh, integration is within the Department of the Navy today and what you think needs to be done to move to where uh, you're going to implement the, the new warfighting concepts. Uh, your point is, is, um, is valid. It's not easy. Uh, two different Title X services that recognize what, the points you're talking about. You know, how would, how would I, uh, how, do, how do I assess it or where do I think it is? In places like Bahrain, um, Japan, San Diego, Norfolk, they're moving like 100 miles an hour. Like always, if you give them the latitude to, to figure out solutions at their level and you don't prescribe, okay, you, here's what you must do because the headquarters says this is the way to do it. If you, don't, if you take those shackles off and you say the end result is we need a better war fighting capability, in your neighborhood looks different than that one. So you, you have a lot of latitude to organize yourselves how you see fit. They're moving. We can't keep up. That's a good place to be, is my point. If the CNO and I cannot keep up with their the integration that's happening at the numbered fleet level, at the Marine Expeditionary Force level, that's great. Because we're not, we're not pushing them. They're actually going, hey, we need this, this, and this to happen fast. That's what it should be. Um, but our system, even manpower, our system is built for a model that resources everybody the same. So we're, we have to build in a whole lot more flexibility than we're accustomed to. So I think the attitude and um, the willingness to try things differently in different places, all I would say outstanding. And it, now we're talking tactical to operational level where they're integrating staffs in a in a mock, in a maritime operations center, on a ship, ashore, because they're learning, as most people would, you know, surmise, the Marine staff has certain strengths, the Navy staff has certain strengths, you put them together, oh man, you know, it's, it's more than one plus one, so that part's all moving really well. Um, what we're not moving at fast enough, frankly, is in the Pentagon. How do we catch, catch up to the doctrine to the resourcing, to the feed-ins from a way of operating, a way of warfighting at the lower tactical levels into the upper sort of joint warfighting level. How do we need to move? We need to get better at that. We need to move faster at that. We need to really capture what the learning and the progress that's being made, and and not not slow it down. Get them the resources that they need. Find kind of creative ways to to provide them what they need in the, from people to money in, in a tailored sort of a way. Because I, I am convinced it's a solution that the commanders in the Middle East are going to come up with is not going to be exactly the same as the others. We should be fine with that. I couldn't agree with you more, sir. I had the pleasure of visiting with Expeditionary Strike Group 3 last week where I stabbed my first beach. Um, but I saw the integration at the staff level there. Um, and uh, how it was working and the complexity of undertaking these amphibious operations, which was pretty astonishing. And I also, we, we, we spoke to uh, the crew of uh, John P. Murtha and talked to them about how they were practicing uh, EABO in recent exercises like Freedom Banner um, in Tinian and Guam and trying to set up bases and work out some of the um, details about how, how these operations would work in practice. So that seems fantastic and is wonderful and absolutely needed. You do need that integration though at the top level and especially with respect to capabilities that you as the Marines rely on the Navy for. You had made comments at the Reagan Forum about um, really being willing to sacrifice force uh, structure for the light amphibious warship. Do you think the Navy views that as a priority um, capability? It's really hard to, um, you know this because you've been, you've traveled in the circles that talk about war fighting. It's really hard to put a value on something you don't have yet. Um, that's really hard because that's risky. It's not a gamble, but it's a risk. It's not proven yet. So something like the light amphibious warship, rightfully so, I think some folks would say, I'm not sure that that's 
what it's going to do what we need it to do. And my point is, if we don't do that, then you'll have the stand-in force that's forward without the organic mobility to move around. They need it. We'll figure out how many. We'll figure out exactly what it ought to look like. But what we can't do is the normal sort of a thing where it'll take us three or four years to assess what our requirement is. We can't, we can't move like that anymore. I don't know, I'm, I'm not happy at all about giving up structure for anything, but I'm convinced that this is what the combatant commanders need. They need a stand in force that's forward. Um, and the things like the light amphibious warships are essential. They're not a nice to have. That is how those commanders are gonna move their forces around in the air, using light amphibious warships on the surface. Otherwise we're limited to where we can pull in with a deep draft, big conventional amphibious ship. We need a lot more flexibility than that. You provided me with a nice segue to the next uh, topic that I wanted to move to, which was the stand and force concept, uh, which mm -hmm. you just released this month. Um, can you explain the impetus for this and just provide a brief summary? Yeah, I think uh, the impetus for it is a discussion, a strategy sort of discussion at the conventional military force, not, not strategic, not nuclear, but conventional force about how are we going to deter a peer adversary or a near peer adversary? How are we going to do that? And there's one argument that says stand off because of the precision strike regime sort of missile defense approach that the PLA has taken that that means long range, they're very precise, high speed weapons, and that's how we're gonna hold each other at bay. And both sides will be deterred. And my read after years of studying it is that plays right into the PLA strategy, which is they would, they would be happy to inch forward every afternoon, a little bit at a time. So the standoff from thousand miles away works right into their strategy. They'll, they'll be exactly where they wanna be five years from now for a lot of reasons. So I think stand in um, answers a lot of questions. Stand off is what is the force that you're gonna need to fight China and win? Okay, that's one way to view it. But that to me equals strategy failure. If we're fighting China, then our strategy has failed. So what we should be asking is, what do we need to prevent conflict from happening? How are we going to assure our partners and allies every day, every week? Um, how, are we going to, how are we going to sense what's in front of us every day, paint a picture of what the adversary is doing? Because their, their effort, I think, is to make sort of a bubble, a shield, push it way, way out. And then they operate in here without being seen, without being there. Nobody's reporting on them. That's perfect for them. That's what happened in the South China Sea, right? So they want to do that over and over again. We have to be in there. We have to be close up forward. So stand in force inside the contested area. How do we help the joint force commander? Because I'm convinced that you need both. You need a whole defense in depth. The standoff alone plays right into the, right into the threat strategy. I'm sure that is uh, very reassuring for lots of allies and partners to hear because they don't want to think that the United States is going to be uh, retreating or standing back, um, which would uh, not be very reassuring to them. Um, one point on this, though, is it seems like this is a bit of an evolution of some of the ideas that you've put forward before because you've been at the forefront with General Brown arguing that we need a new readiness model that's uh, less focused on being ready to deploy and presence and more focused on preparing to be ready for a big war fight. Um, how do you square the circle between these two? I don't think they're, they're not mutually exclusive, of course, no. Um, you do need to know the Secretary of Defense does need to know what's available this afternoon. He absolutely does, because if something happens this afternoon, he's going to turn to the chairman and the Joint Chiefs and go, what, what do we have in the barn? What, OK, what do we have now? So we have to know that. Absolutely do. But when we make decisions to allocate, to use today's forces around the world, we got to do it with a mind of what's the penalty? What's the cost you're going to pay two, three, four years into the future? We don't have a fantastic way of 
explaining that to the secretary of painting that picture for him. So General Brown and I are working to give him the whole picture. Here's what you have that's available this afternoon. If you run the engine at this RPM sort of, if you use it at this rate, this is what will happen in the future in terms of the force you're going to need. Because right now it's, we don't have the right structure. We don't have the right tools to paint that complete picture for him. So he's, he's using things today, not really with a, the clearest picture of what the impact might be three, four five years into the future. We need, we owe him that so that he can make the, all the, all the right decisions when it comes time to, you know, allocate the force in the near term. We need both, but right now we don't have, we have the first, we have the, what's available in the barn this afternoon. We don't have all, the, all that we need to give him the second part, the longer view. That makes sense. I mean, you have to understand the implications of these choices and realize that there are often um, opportunity costs and knock on effects in terms of readiness that you've seen um, all of the services having to deal with, given the pace of operations the last few decades. Um, yeah. you, you, the Marines have been really prolific in terms of coming up with new uh, uh, concepts. You have the stand-in forces, you have Loki littoral operations and contested environment in EABO, expeditionary advanced base operations. Can you talk about how these um, fit together or what the relationship is between them? Sure. Um, several years ago, the, the chief of naval operations and the commandant putting their heads and their staffs together thought through distributed maritime operations. How would they how would the naval forces operate in a different way, in a more distributed way to counter what they saw as a rising threat? So I, I would probably trace back where we are now to distributed maritime operations. After that, okay, if that's if we're going to operate in a distributed manner, then we thought our way through littoral operations in a contested environment, both being important. In other words, the littoral part of that, that's the environment and the contested part. Okay, both of them were important. Then we tried to figure, then we start to think about, okay, if that's the environment, then how? What's the methods that we might use? And then that was expeditionary advanced base ops. This is how the Marines, as part of a naval maritime element, can operate in a distributed manner forward uh, and support, enable the whole joint force. In other words, not just as Marines, but actually fit into the bigger picture. So EABO is a tentative, sort of the, the tentative manual that we published is a beginning as, as we did in World War II with landing uh, landing force. This is the beginning of how we might facilitate that joint active campaigning to, to try to deter and then respond if we need to. So all that's the sort of nesting that you're referring to. The stand in force, again, la the last part is thinking our way through if that all is true in the future, then how does a, a standoff force, which we're going to need, what is the complement to that that creates the defense in depth that we that we think the Joint Force Commander, the COCOM, needs? And that's the genesis. That's of course sort of the origin of a stand-in force. Not new at all. We've had stand-in forces since before World War II. We just didn't call them that. So I'm using a frame of reference so that we create for combatant commanders an entire defense in depth. And that's not linear. It's it's faced up against a, a really capable adversary. He's got to look in, com in depth from near to, to deep. That's what we're trying to create. That's super helpful um, and makes a lot of sense in terms of how those different concepts relate to each other and help you to achieve the overall goal of strengthening deterrence against China. Um, We've talked a lot about Navy and Marine Corps integration and the relationship between the two, but there's a bigger picture here that we have to bring in as well, and that's the entire joint force. And it seems like each of the services, or at least the departments, is uh, moving in slightly different directions. You have Joint All Domain Command and Control with the Air Force, you have multi domain operations in the Army, you have the Joint Warfighting Concept and the Joint Staff. How, how does how do the Marines relate to all of these other concepts and how do they integrate into the joint force? How, if you're if someone were looking for an umbrella, I would I would I would 
uh, identify, I would say that's the joint war fighting construct, which is in development. It's not, it's not ever going to be finished because this is the whole nature of a pacing threat. They're moving and so are we. So it's never going to be stagnant like we're done. We have the joint war fighting construct. It's good for five years. Both of us are moving. So it's going to be in refinement continuously. I'd say that's the umbrella. The JAD C2, the Joint All Domain Command and Control, goes across all services and all domains. That's an that's an acknowledgement that we're going to need to stitch together all these systems into some kind of into a coherent whole if we're going to see and understand what's in front of us and be able to respond. So it's not that's not a service thing. That's an acknowledgement across the joint force that in the future, the digital part of war fighting, all of it's got to be stitched together. All of it's got to be fused together. I think the subordinate element underneath the joint war fighting concepts, there's, there's a lot of work going on in the Pentagon to flesh out the sort of feeders to that to make sure that the concept itself is all tied together. And, and, and you don't need uh, uh, an advanced degree to, to sort through it. We will need the ability to handle logistics in a contested environment. The whole joint force will, because we're used to doing logistics. We're not, we haven't, it's been a long time since we've had to do it in a contested environment at the, at the operational level, been a long time, been decades. So there's, there's, there's the umbrella of the joint warfighting concept there's feeders underneath there that, that contribute to that. And then there's things, I think, like joint all domain command and control that go across all, all of it and all domains. And that's a, that's a disciplining ourselves to know that we can't continue to buy one of them and one of them and one of them and they don't talk to each other. We have to, if we're going to move at speed and make decisions at speed, we've got to stitch it all together. That uh, does seem to be uh, necessary to realize the vision that um, has been laid out in general about con connecting different domains so that you can achieve yeah. integrated deterrence. Um, what do you think is the biggest impediment to um, actually fully implementing this vision? Is it culture? Is it command and control? Who's in charge? Is it technology, the actual you know, bits and bytes in the different um, communication systems? Um, you've highlighted a couple of them 15, 20 minutes ago. The bureaucracy is a challenge. We have to think and act and acquire and test at a different speed than perhaps we're, we were comfortable with because that's the pace of both the technological change and also the speed at which our adversary is moving. Both of them are pushing us. So what slows us down? Definitely the process, the bureaucratic part of it. Sometimes the world gets in the way. You know, the U.S. is a global power, so we have global responsibilities. We have vital national interest around the world. So sometimes it's the things you didn't see coming that can throw your attention somewhere else. We, we should be able to manage that. We will be able to manage that, but everything has to be, has to be prioritized. And this is sort of the crisis response 9-11, you know, this is the this is why you have a Marine Corps, right? For to, to handle the things that popped up that you just didn't, maybe everybody didn't see coming. Resources will always be an issue, but I, I, we, I don't have a lot of patience for whining. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. There's, I don't, or they, or I hear the, the, the phrase, we're in a resource constrained environment. Like, when have we not? Been, when, tell me when it was unconstrained. I'd like to know when that was, because I've only been a Marine for 40 years, but it's never been like, have, have, whatever you need, just go out and run to the store and buy it. It's never been that way. We should be able to discipline ourselves, know how to operate within the family budget that we have. Marine Corps for the last two years, this year will be the same. We haven't asked for any increase in our budget. Inflation only, not one dollar more. Because we have to be the best stewards of the taxpayer's dollar. We have to demonstrate to ourselves that we're squeezing everything we can out of it. Well, none of that is unmanageable. None of it is. Um, we, like Chairman uh, Milley says, we can't make China to be 10 feet tall, but we can't be our own worst drag on ourselves either. we got to move past that. we got to, one, convince ourselves that we can move at that speed. 
and then just then do it, work together as a team. Last part I would say um, that can get in the way is parochialism, the advocacy, that I have to fight for my own piece of the pie, you know, against everybody else. If that, ha if that starts to encroach in this building, then that'll slow us down. Um, shouldn't happen because we all understand what the joint force has to be able to do. We all understand we, we must operate as a joint force and we must operate with allies and partners. So it shouldn't, that shouldn't be a big factor. But in the back of my mind, I'm, I mean, we should all be conscious that can creep in there. At any moment, it can creep in there. I, I couldn't agree with you more about prioritization and making choices and actually being able to do so within the confines of the budget that we have today. That's uh, what my colleagues and myself argued in our recent report, Risky Business. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you and the Marines should be commended for um, trying to balance the books and actually making those hard choices, which is a tough thing to do, um, but really important and necessary in the environment that we face. Um, keep the questions coming in. I'm going to turn to them in one second. I first want to jump back to a topic that you mentioned in uh, early in the, our conversation, sir, which was talent management um, mm -hmm. and uh, my colleague, Kate Kuzminski, who's the director of our Military Veterans and Society program, had um, asked me to, to ask you what the mm -hmm. impetus was for your talent management 2030 plan. Um, so I was hoping you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the manpower process that we have in the Marine Corps has worked. It's not it's not. Um, this isn't because our system is broken today, failing us. We're not recruiting. It's not, that's not the problem. The system we've had since, since uh, we went to an all-volunteer force has pretty much stayed the same, and it's worked. But I am convinced, we are convinced, that the, we're seeing the beginnings of why our current system won't match where we need to be. Um, we have to move from a system that treated looked at us as a way of moving numbers to individual can we match the right person with the right talent with the needs of the organization and then can we convince that person can we incentivize that person that's performing at the high level and shows potential can we can we can we incentivize them can we convince them to stay can we retain them we have been largely a recruit a very young force and then four years later, out the back door they go. That's That has been the way that we've operated for 30, 35 years. We're convinced that going forward, we need a better balance of young high school graduates and a more mature, more experienced force. We're going to need a little bit different balance to actually operate in the way that our concepts are, are headed. So it's not an indictment of the past at all. Or a recruiter or anybody else. Those They're they have done exactly what we needed them to do. But that that const, that industrial age sort of framework that we've had, I am convinced will not meet what we need to do in the future. We have to rebalance recruiting and retention and how we look at each individual and develop them through their through their career. Just it's a different approach. That makes sense. Uh, what type of Marines or what skills are you really looking for uh, or what are what is necessary for Force Design 2030 in the EABO? Um, some people, I think, fair enough, have asked me, oh, I guess we're looking for a more technical person. My answer is no, not necessarily. Inside, back to the ethos part, they join, people join the Marine Corps largely for the same reasons I did, because it's a challenge. There's a, there, you want to be part of a, an elite force. You want to, you want to travel. You want to be, uh, you want to push yourself physically and mentally to, to places you, you haven't been before. All this, those are, those aren't, those don't change. Um, all those stay the same. Well, now though, what we have, what we're have, what we have right now, the tools to look at you and me who are in college or high school in a whole, much more holistic way. We have much better tools than we did when, when I came in which was take, take this academic test, go out there and run three miles and do some pull-ups, and then we'll see if you're good enough. They just didn't, they, that was the tool set that, were, that they had. We have much, we have more tools now to better understand the whole person. Now we're trying to match that with what the Marine Corps needs in the future. All that to say, you can teach people technical skills. You can teach them that. 
we need we need people who are have the mental agility who can make decisions under pressure who can learn who can operate as a team who are tough who are resilient in other words in a in a, in a really austere challenging environment they'll they're going to step up um, they see the team as more important as th than themselves so it's not we're not looking for a, a computer scientist because that's the future of the marine corps we need somebody who's, who can manage four or five different skills um, because you're going to have to do multiple things. Not one, can't do one thing and then get away with it. You're going to have to do, be able to do multiple things with the resilience, the adaptability that we're going to need for the future. But inside, in here, same thing as me. Same thing as every Marine always has been. Same thing. That's great. Um Turning now to some of the questions from the audience, Michael Bond asked, uh, what role do you envision for vertical lift uh, in future operations? And I'm gonna add to that, um, how does that relate and how do you plan to use unmanned aerial systems as well? Mm, great question. Um, you asked about the light amphibious warship before, vertical lift. Vertical lift plus surface lift, um, there could be a time in the future where it's subsurface. I don't know. What we owe commanders, if if you're the commander of a, one of these elements that's forward, I need to give you the tools so that you can move, reposition that force around organically. In other words, not bring it from a thousand miles away, but it's there, it's there with you. So vertical lift, that's how you're going to reposition forces. That's how you're going to do logistics in a in a contested environment really hard to pick out helicopters in a in a cluttered environment really hard to target them um, so vertical lift from the 53 to the mv22 all those are key going forward they have to ha they're going to have the signatures be kind of going to become even more important their electronic signature just not their visible but their electronic signature their refuelability their their ability to go on on naval ships which all marine vertical lift, helicopters do, all that's important. Range, speed, signature, signature management, all those are important. Basically think of every flying helicopter in the Marine Corps being like a like a 5G tower that's on the move. <laughs> like it's constantly moving information and data. It's everything, every single flying thing is its own um, 5G t cell tower sort of equivalent. So what does that mean for unmanned? I think that we're going to a much more of a balance between manned and unmanned. We have to, for a lot of reasons. We can cover a lot more territory with the same number of people if we're really employing unmanned systems in, the, in a smart, tactical way. Could it be part of vertical lift? Absolutely, yes. Why would we not use that to resupply, to rearm, to sustain forces unmanned? We, we, did, it, I, we did it in Afghanistan. We used unmanned helicopters to move ammo and fuel and water. So why would, absolutely we would do that. Is there still a role for man? I, absolutely there is. So I don't know, you know, some people, are, what's the balance? I don't know. We're gonna learn as we go, but we have to push hard on unmanned to go to learn that faster, not go slow. Because we'll, if we take it the normal sort of creep along pace, we're, we'll be behind. We will not catch up. So I think we have to push hard into unmanned systems, vertical lift being part of it. Everything flying is a flying sensor, a flying fuser, a flying mover of information, and it's hauling stuff and people as well. So mixed fleet seems to make a lot of sense and uh, to be the direction the Air Force is moving in as well. And mobility is obviously critical for survivability. Mm. And we've seen our adversaries employ this to great effect um, with their mobile missiles and their air defenses. So adopting that approach also hopefully can work, work for the US forces at the same time. Uh, the next question is from John Doyle. He uh, says that with all the planned changes in how to fight in the Indo-Pacific region, I worry about a 21st century Wake Island scenario. How can that be avoided? Hmm. John is a student of history. Timely too. If you know history, you know what today is. Um, 
21st century Wake Island. John, here's what here's how I would say it. Wake Island will happen or could happen. The chances of Wake Island in the 21st century go up if we don't have the ability to do sensing forward, the ability to strip away an adversary's eyes and ears. Some would call it like a reconnaissance, counter-reconnaissance sort of um, effort. Um, older writers would call it a scouting, counter-scouting. Same idea, though. We can't be surprised. Um, Wake Island only happened because we didn't see it, you know, we couldn't see it coming early enough. We have to be forward as a stand-in force. We have to be the eyes and ears of the, of the, of the joint force. Not, in other words, the balance of sensors has to be from satellite all the way down to terrestrial, all of it, so that nothing happens in front of us without us knowing it, without us understanding it. Last part of that, I would say, John, is this: the stand-in force that we're working on isn't just Marines. I we think it's entirely possible that it's a, it's Marines, it's Coast Guard. It's special operations. It could be the subsurface fleet, allies and partners. All of them forward means Wake Island doesn't happen. It means we're not surprised. It means we can see, we can sense what's in front of us. That it, That is certainly the hope and to uh, not be taken by surprise like that. Next question is from Jeremy Rocket, and uh, he asks how you and other senior Marine Corps leaders are using data at scale in decision science to make crucial decisions about your force design and where key investments are being made to ensure that they are best aligned. Uh, fascinating question uh, or issue. Uh, Jeremy, I met the, the CEO of Google Cloud in California last weekend. Didn't know Mr. Curian before. I knew who he was because you read. That's what we talked about for 30 minutes. Uh, not limited to Google Cloud, but what the, the points that you raised. How are we going to use data at scale for everything from training to operations? How are we going to do that? And that's what. That's why I, I, I met with Mr. Curian because I needed to pick his brains about what is in the what do you see as possible? Um, I would, I would offer a couple things. First, we, we're getting comfortable with um, zero trust. Um, began with in, everything's encrypted, now getting to zero trust. That's hard um, in a lot of ways, but we're, we are there. So collect all the data, zero trust, access to it. For the Marines, for the forward forces where the Marines will be, it's, it's learning through what they need at the edge. If Stacy's at the edge, what does she need with her in terms of data to make decisions? And what can she pull from a cloud, from somewhere else in the back? And when will she need that information? So I think the need for information and data processing and storage and what you're going to do with it is varies depending on how far away from the threat you are. The more forward you are, Stacy does not need everything in the inventory. She needs what she needs. So we have to figure out at the edge, computing and data storage wise and access wise, what does she need to make the decisions that the tactical leaders need to make? Data and artificial intelligence help her weed out the routine mundane sort of decisions off to the side, get her, allow her to focus on the judgment sort of decisions that tactical commanders have to make. So we have to apply artificial intelligence laid over top of it so that the volume of data that she has is managed, pushed off into categories. And she can focus now not on distractors, not on the entirety, but in the things that she needs to focus on. How do you use it at scale? This is the ability to touch data, no matter whether you're in California or you're at the further forwardmost edge and in a contested environment. I, I think it's not a, not a big secret that if, if command and control data systems are really important in the future of warfare, then that's what we should expect that 
that's going to be challenged for us. And we're going to challenge their ability to get the same information, the same data. So we're working in an environment where we're both trying to go after each other's command and control. I think here, long way of saying, we, we talk with industry about what they see as possible today and the path to the future. We get comfortable with things like zero trust. We, we are practical about what Stacy needs at the forward edge, which isn't the whole kitchen cabinet. It's what is what actually does she need to make tactical decisions at the level that she's at and not flutter with, oh, but you have access to the entire universe of data. No, she doesn't need that. She needs what she needs. So we have to, we have to figure out how to get her at the edge, the ability to pull and fuse and make decisions at speed inside a threat's decision-making timeframe. That's the magic of it. As anybody will tell you, sir, that works with me, I quickly get overwhelmed by data. So finding the right pieces and feeding them to me is, is incredibly important as it is to most people, I think, when we live in this world today where we're flooded with information. I'm gonna to try to uh, get in two last questions. So I'm gonna pose them both, sure. even though they don't necessarily uh, fit together. The first one is from Aiden Quigley. And he said that you had mentioned that uh, some new capabilities were gonna um, enter service in 2023. What capabilities are you talking about specifically and how will those aid Marine Corps operations? And then I have a different question from a former colleague, Gene Germanovich, who asked if you could comment on how the Marines will conduct operations in Europe and the Middle East and how that will differ from those in the Indo-Pacific region. I can do both in a couple of minutes. New capabilities. Um, there's, as you might expect, a number of them. I'll just focus on maybe one or two. Um, Ground-based anti-ship missiles. Um, think the replacement for the Humvee with the top cut off of it, unmanned with an elevated Atel, a launcher on the back that can launch missiles and hold both maritime and land targets at risk. And there's and there's a number of these and they're unmanned and one of them may or may not be manned as sort of a quarterback of these other ones. And you can you can move them around, you can position them where you want. They're they're tied in together with your radars and your sensing systems and the threat now has to know that you can hold their ships at risk and their ground forces too. So we will have that capability in 23. We'll have the light amphibious warships as fast as we can procure them. Advancements to our radar systems, we are already we're already flying the F-35 forward. All these things are coming pretty, pretty rapidly. So capabilities that we don't have right now, I would think an example, not the only one, would be things like an anti-ship missile capability with the Marines forward very difficult to pick up, easy to move around, force the adversary to adjust how they operate. Europe and the Middle East, what changes there? I think our concepts like stand-in forces are applicable anywhere. Um, this is how we operate forward, whether it's in the, in the Gulf uh, or in the Mediterranean. We're going to operate inside the threat's weapons ranges. That's where the Marines have always operated. That's where we're comfortable operating in. So the, the concepts, the operational concepts are universally, they're applicable, whether it's the Indo-Pacific and the East China Sea or the Black Sea or the Gulf of Aden, all the same. Um, same requirements, same thought processes, same level of training to operate inside an adversary's weapon engagement zone. And the ability to respond to crisis, of course, we don't know where the next one will happen. So could be in Europe, could be in the Middle East, uh, could be in Africa, don't know. Or if there are forces have to be trained and equipped to handle those crises from a sea base any, anywhere, on the, anywhere on the face of the earth. The world does have a way of intervening uh, with the best laid plans, um, as we've seen time and time again. Well, we are out of time today. Um, I want to thank you, sir, General Berger. This has been a fantastic conversation that I've enjoyed tremendously. And thanks to the audience for tuning in and for asking such um, pointed mm -hmm. questions. Thanks very much, Stacey. They were fantastic. I learned it every time. So thanks very much for having me on today.